Kirby 64 might not share the magic experience of bringing Kirby into the third dimension just like many other Nintendo IPs but became kinda memorable due to the fact of being one of the very few two-dimensional platformers on the Nintendo 64. At least the visuals benefit from a much more powerful hardware and make use of dynamic camera shifts and expressive animations. Due to the technological improvement there are still people thinking Kirby 64 is actually a three-dimensional game which could be due to the many impressive bosses offering surprisingly difficult challenges and making great use of the Nintendo 64's power. By adding three first tutorial bosses to the mix, it should not come off as a surprise to see the possessed Waddle Dee, or in this case Waddle Do, on the last place. The battle, if you can even call it a battle, is just one small sequence to show the powers of dark matter, introduce the concept of a boss and add a little piece to the reasoning why Kirby will have partners in the first case. There are even mini bosses and regular enemies which are probably harder to overcome, but the entertaining quirky soundtrack in combination with Waddle Doo's clumsiness makes this short quarrel too sweet to seriously complain. At the top of his never consistent castle, King DDD snatches a piece of the crystal only to get tricked by dark matter, and expectedly getting mind controlled. While Waddle Dee was a original fight, albeit in the simple side, DDD's brawl is almost identical to Dreamland 3, with the first regular phase on the ground and the second one where the penguin awakens his inner eye and starts to float. It's nice to have a DDD confrontation despite his role of an ally in this game, but the fight itself is unfortunately painfully slow and it takes your enemy extremely long to start his attacks. Like I said with Waddle Dee, however, these battles are not about offering series amazing clashes and you can basically perceive it as a remake of Dreamland's 3 variation but with 3D graphics. Adeline is the second main encounter and just like DDD a copy of Dreamland's 3 boss in the sky. By drawing pictures of a certain foe, she awakens her art to life and hides behind her painting due to her fragile nature. Unlike with DDD, however, the paintings are not the same, admittedly much easier because of being placed at the start of the game, but at least different nonetheless. The way she whines about every loss is unexpectedly adorable, and they even implemented the final phase of their running towards Kirby desperately. All of those three battles are a great taste of what is to come, and something in me wishes there would be a small boss at the end of every level. The first proper boss and all-time rival, Wispy Woods, guards one of the crystal pieces and summons his children in order to win. Although the game features no three-dimensional gameplay in its campaign, it's the first time to witness Wispy in 3D visuals, and the creators gave their best to at least create the illusion of depth by building a circular arena with Wispy being placed at the center. It's an extremely smart move since a tree looks the same from all angles, which clearly spared some time for animations. Speaking of wasting no time, in today's Kirby games normally you get a lead up to the boss, setting the atmosphere and choosing between a handful of copy Abilities. There is not such a chance in Kirby 64, with the battle starting abruptly once you enter the field. It may be considered outdated, as you have to enter another level for a copy ability, but I would argue those bosses are designed and more enjoyable without any skills. Fighting Wispy himself is just as uncomplicated as you would expect, with classic breath and apple attack serving as a means to kill off innocent children. Once his bloodline is undone, Wispy converts into a Wiggler-esque tantrum and uses his roots and even more apples to spice up the action. It's still fairly easy and every skill poses no problem to dodge, but by giving you only the option to strike back when the roots are out, this rendition of Wispy circumvents the issue of ending the clash too quickly. The way the roots drill through the earth in combination with the massive sound design is more entertaining than it should be, and you get everything you would expect from the first Wispy brawl on a 3D home console. As another returner from Dreamland 3, Akro upgraded his tactics and plays out a little different from his crayon style alternative. 
instead of starting on plain grounds and switching the occasions to his home turf. 64's first phase resembles fundamentally Dreamland 3's second one. With the copyability, it might be easier to land a hit, but due to Kirby's inability to defend himself in any capacity underwater in this game, the only option to deal damage is by inhaling Arcro's projectiles and spitting them back. At the end of each side of the cave, he starts to perform powerful body slams, but also doesn't move as much, giving you a moment for a counter. It can be surprisingly difficult to perfectly time each blow, but there's the special trick of inhaling the cutter enemy, holding him up and using his never-ending bullets as a means for the offensive. This flexibility in how you approach a battle is still unmatched in the series and a unique factor, setting 64's playstyle clearly apart from modern titles. Obviously this isn't everything to the battle and after deleting the enemy's health bar once, the underwater cave starts to crumble down, leading you slowly to the top. Now the fight increases its verticality tremendously while Akro shoots torpedoes from below, provoking you to swim similarly slow but with the risk of getting swallowed by the auto scrawler. It may sound more challenging but it's actually very doable and arguably much more easier than the first phase. What I enjoy about the shift between the phases, not only in this case but substantially in every other boss as well, is how the game feels no need to show any kind of transition cutscene. In modern titles when you have the health bar of a boss, the camera slowly zooms in as the foe rages and interrupts the gameplay for a very brief moment to establish the second phase. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this more modern cinematic approach, but the plainness and ongoing action in Kirby 64 is something I really appreciate about every skirmish. If you think Kirby bosses couldn't get any more simplistic in their design, the Pix crystals might change your mind. Three colorful crystals resemble the boss of the second world and while people could get the impression the creators are plainly lazy in imagination, back in the day, just like modern titles, Kirby games captivate younger players not only with digestible gameplay, but easy to comprehend character design as well. If a child can draw a character from the Kirby universe, even without any artistic skills, then it's a perfect design for the game. The crystals fulfill that role absolutely perfectly and offer a quality fight on top of that. Initially, it's a little confusing what to do since you consistently dodge all sorts of attacks without any chance for a counter strike. This is only to wait until the antique structure reaches the top and offers strange colorful adjusted objects for you to inhale. It's not a brain breaker to figure out which of them is meant for which crystal, but the complete pace of the battle changes and is a nice contrast to the faster first phase. It also kinda proves my suspicion that these bosses were created without copy abilities in mind, or at least become much more difficult and enjoyable, which is why the creators should definitely consider some kind of restriction during major battles in the future again. Design-wise, Mac-Man might not come off as particularly intimidating and is clearly inspired by Wispy, but their battles couldn't be more different. With the foe in the background and limited space to stay safe from the hot magma, you can only jump between a couple platforms and have to avoid the burning ceiling on top of all sorts of attacks. Magman actually never appears in the foreground and just like with Wispy, you have to go for his pillars being connected to his body. The first try could be rather challenging, as it could be hard to predict how each technique behaves. Regarding it might appear like the magma pillars move randomly every time. However, there's actually a pattern and once you figure out how to maneuver around all those obstacles, it's time for phase 2. Magman chases you to a more safe space in the dark cave, but faces you off directly with his massive body. It isn't quite obvious at the beginning, but the only vulnerable part is his expressionless visage and Kirby has to perform high jumps and timed attacks in order to win. The crashing rocks offer great opportunities for some powerful projectiles and the arguably most dangerous skill is a mighty fire breath, only avoidable when sticking to Magman's body, something you avoided throughout the whole battle. It's a great mix-up of inherited patterns and looks all the more impressive at the same time. It should be different from person to person, but I consider Magman to be the hardest regular boss for someone experiencing the game with no prior knowledge due to many unexpected attacks that need time to figure out how to avoid them. I think I would have preferred a complete chase sequence, similar to the one in a level prior to the boss, but regardless, Magman is a surprisingly hard boss in the series known for being a cakewalk. 
One of the most iconic yet underexplored antagonists of the series is the reincarnated Angel Zero Two, another version of Dreamlands 3 final encounter. After traveling through the whole universe and gathering all the crystal shards, the object Dark Matter tried so desperately to shatter completes itself and reveals the hidden menace buried within the Fairy Queen. In accordance with the Dreamland saga, this ending will only be unlocked with getting the 100% and is even teased if you fail to accomplish such a deed. The final world, Dark Star, consists of a very short sequence, highlighting each partner one last time and launching you into the probably most unnerving Kirby final boss to this day. The battle itself is fairly simple. By shooting crystal shards into Zero Two's bloody eyeball, you manage to destroy his balance, take out the halo and aim for the weak point. Initially, it might be a little awkward to circumvent around the projectiles and find a rhythm when and how to shoot, but after getting a feeling for how to move, the climax is actually quite simplistic and surprisingly easy. The true star of the show is the atmosphere, with the surrounding resembling some kind of hellish dimension, underlined by an extremely somber theme that stays in direct contrast to the intrinsic happiness of the series. Kirby games have their fair share of rather gloomy moments, but often these moments are cut by a heroic comeback and incorporate some kind of turning point presenting how the tables turn. There's no such a thing as that in Zero Two's case and the battle ends just as abruptly as it starts. Smaller details like a fake small at the beginning before revealing its true form or being able to destroy the wings for no particular reason add a little depth to an otherwise plain badland and despite the fact it should be a disappointing encounter for being the true final boss on the first and only mainline Kirby game for the Nintendo 64, there is just something that remains memorable. The original Zero in Dreamland 3 stays iconic because of his shock factor, shooting with his own blood shamelessly to test the limits of an H rating. Zero 2 on the other hand cannot rely on such a situation again and instead aims to improve on that foundation and wins with with one convincing total package instead of one shock moment. Players would love to see more background information behind Zero Two, but I think this is one of the few cases where elaborated lore would actually damage the mystique of this character. It seems like the creators have similar views, hence never bringing him properly back besides small appearances, even though they love to rely on nostalgia. But if there is going to be the day of a Kirby 64 remake, I hope they will keep the simplistic approach and not over dramatize the arguably most plain yet memorable Kirby final boss. What would be a game without a good fight against a giant robot? HRH is a mechanical monstrosity staying in the background and shooting lasers as well as rockets. The setup is similar to Mac Man, with the goal being visible at all time but giving you only few opportunities to strike back. The only way of getting to him is to catch the giant arms which are occasionally used to swipe you off the ground. It's much harder to time in comparison to Mac Man since you have to simultaneously dodge the attack and aim correctly. Once the robot sees himself cornered, he shifts his form, goes for a hyper offensive strategy. What I wished for in the Magman fight is basically realized in this situation with the machine chasing you while trying to cut Kirby in half. The auto-scroller keeps you moving and adds a slight increase of difficulty without creating the irritating nature of being forced to adjust to the movement speed. The greatest feat of this boss has nothing to do with the boss gameplay design, however. It's about the scope and difference in height between your enemy and Kirby. The series is no stranger to larger than life opponents, but Kirby 64 really understands how to subtly move the camera in a way to emphasize every single detail. How the robot tries to smash you from a buff or the very minor camera movement when you run from left to right. The height of this machine is simply tangible and makes up a fitting duel before the final. To this day, this is probably the best start to a seeming Kirby final boss in the series. 
Miracle Meta is the supposed to be last step on the adventure and Miro's Kirby's trademark skill of being able to perform every ability in the campaign to some extent. Naturally, he's not able to combine any talents, but this doesn't make him any weaker due to the circumstance of being immune to almost all attacks. The only way to cause any harm is to make use of the ability Miracle Meta is currently using or shooting projectiles in case it takes too long. You cannot attack with fire while Miracle Meta uses rock and you have to always change skills consistently in order to adapt to the situation. Every elemental state is tied to a limited health pool, so you're going to take out each Miracle Meta variation piece by piece, indicated by a noticeable explosion effect. The way the battle starts with the introduction of the classic boss theme but turning into a much more darker tone is a nice fake out to suggest that this battle is very different in comparison to other enemies in the game. Normally there's always a way to cheese a boss, use an overpowered ability or other tricks to secure a win if you struggle. In Miracle Matters case there's not such a trick and this is probably the most fair and honest confrontation in the series. On top of that, despite the fact Kirby is stripped of his most reliable skill to some extent, the restriction is also a perfect way to incorporate every ability into the fight and force you to adapt. There's no other battle in the franchise where you're pressured to switch skills as often as in this case and it's really surprising to see how the IP never really tried that approach so drastically again. It also switches the expected convention of testing everything the player learned at the end by stripping off everything he learned and throwing him into a situation never seen before. The core gameplay however stays the same and you just have to think around the corner to win the fight. The cherry on top is a very fair and challenging difficulty, giving you no options to heal or even withdrawing from the clash. There might not be any exciting cutscenes, sequences, camera shifts or expositions, but all of this adds to the sheer force of Miracle Meta and the core gameplay of this fight is so excellent it doesn't need any fluff and there is a reason people regard this to be the true final test of skills of Kirby 64. Despite the fact modern two-dimensional Kirby titles exceed the Nintendo 64 when it comes to hardware power, there is something about these bosses that still feels very distinct in their execution. The slower, sluggish gameplay of Kirby 64 makes it harder to avoid attacks and the general difficulty is a little more challenging than what you would expect from the series. Not to speak of the iconic final boss that lets people theorize about the existence of dark matter. It goes without saying that Kirby 64 is slightly rough around some edges, but maybe we get the chance to experience those enemies one day in a proper remake.